Okay, article number four okay. is about acute lower GI bleeding. So now we're in the gastrointestinal tract. Yeah, we're we back to the GI tract. <laughs> we had diarrhea, now we're back <laughs> now at we're gonna it. Bleed. Now we're going to bleed. Now we're going to bleed. Okay, so this is a New England Journal article. This is from 2017, and it's written by some GI doctors. So yes. again, kind of mm. goes a little bit outside the bounds of emergency medicine, but some good fundamental principles for there us are. to keep in mind. This is another one of those clinical practice articles yeah, just which like you just said you like. Yeah. So um, Although remember, I like it when it's more ER based. I do too. Okay. And this That's one is that. a little bit goes mm -hmm. a little again yeah. beyond. Okay. Now, lower GI bleeding is defined as, I say hematochesia. Do you say I hematochesia? Do I do too. Okay, I've heard some people say hematochesia, which no, is wrong. No, that sounds like food. It's wrong. That sounds yeah. like a bad okay, food. So no. people, it's we hematochesia. Like kesia. Okay. It's kesia. Okay, so when you have bleeding from your bottom, it's hematochesia, and that might be coming from your colon. It could be coming from your rectum. And when you have GI bleeding, um, overall, if you look at all GI bleeding, it's less than half that's from lower GI bleeding. In fact, it's 30 to 40% mm -hmm. that's from a, a lower source. And most of the time, actually, it usually stops. Right. You, know, you have a little bleeding, and then it stops without any kind of complications, except for people who have coexisting illnesses, the older folks. Those are the people that we see who have real trouble yep. with this. And this article really focuses on, we're not talking about the little you know, intermittent bleeding. We're talking about large volume colorectal bleeding. And what is sort of the state of the art and state of the union in this respect? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so obviously the patient who comes in with a lot of bleeding, any kind of bleeding, we are working them up and resuscitating them simultaneously. Is this news to you? Uh, so uh, this, that's why I love articles <laughs> I that aren't written by ER people. It's like, wow, <laughs> can we do like, that? Yeah, I know. <laughs> you have to tell me to do that? Wow, okay. okay. So realize that your workup and resuscitation go together. And and then you want to take a good history. And this is true for, you know, lots of things that we do. But in the case of lower GI bleeding, what are the kind of questions you want to ask? You want to ask about the color of what they've seen. What is the amount? How often has it happened? How long has it been going on for? And then you want to focus on thinking a little bit up the track. Where the, could this be coming from? Do you have infectious colitis? Have you mm -hmm. been traveling recently? Do you have a fever? Do you have cancer? Might you have peptic ulcer disease? And we'll talk a little bit about how lower GI bleeding can actually be upper GI upper. bleeding. Mm -hmm. And then you want to think about what are their other medical problems and what medications are they on? Are they on any um, anticoagulants, antiplatelet agents, NSAIDs, all those kinds of things that would obviously Make influence the yeah. bleeding. And we're going to do exam. Now, uh, the authors say we should do vitals. That's important. But they also advocate for postural vitals, which I thought I just, went out a long time I ago. I did, too. <laughs> yeah, I, so, so look at that. Is, you're having massive lower GI bleeding, and I'm going to stand, stand you up, up to see uh, what happens to your blood pressure and your no. heart rate. Let's not do yeah, that. It's in but there, they, but it's so in there. I, I gave yeah. it lip service with parentheses. Uh, yes, so, yeah. yeah that's, it's, the parentheses were my addition. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to obviously do a, a cardiopulmonary exam, an abdominal exam, and then we've got to take a look at the area in question to see what is going on down there. And in fact, you may consider not only just putting your finger up there, but also doing an anoscopy where you look with the little plastic thing, would lube it up, look it up there to see what you can see. Because it turns out that one out of every five or 20% of lower GI bleeding is actually due to hemorrhoids. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes if you don't see them externally, you can't actually see them if you use anoscopy, which is not that big a deal to do. So you might consider that if it's within your scope of practice and your questions that you have in your mind about this patient. You're going to send your labs. It's no surprise that on that list would be a CD. BC, your coagulation studies, a type and screen if they're bleeding. And remember that that BUN creatinine ratio is something that can be important in GI bleeding because if it turns out that that ratio is greater than 30 to 1, the BUN to creatinine, that suggests an upper GI bleed. Right, because you're absorbing all the nitrogen as you're digesting it from above. Correct. So that's something to think about. Okay, what kind of patients will do badly with a GI bleed? I bet you don't even have to have this article uh, you know, to give me a I list think, of who's going to do I bet even that. people driving in their cars could, could give us this exact it. list without looking. Let's see if it matches up with your mental list. Yeah. So that patient who is hypotensive, shocker. <gasps> okay. Tachycardic. Oh. Again, they just keep bleeding. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they're on the older side. <laughs> okay, that one I object to. Yeah, well, okay. They put 60. They I put 60. Like okay, okay, yeah. And then, I don't know. Okay, whatever. Right, so yeah. I can object to that one. Okay, <laughs> and they've got renal problems. That means that they're probably sicker underlying in general, but if they're creatinine, they say is over 1.7, which must have come from some study of sure some did. population. I'm sure and it did. That, you know that, that that particular value was associated with worse outcomes. Um, and if certainly if they're unstable, that would be they're sicker, or they've got like pretty bad medical problems, significant coexisting conditions. All of those things would be risk factors for adv adverse outcomes. And the more things you have on that list, the worse your outcome is probably going to be. But they don't tell us a whole lot no. about who can go home, which right. is a much more relevant question exactly. for so us. I don't. I know who's sick. I know who's I sick. I know, know who's who coming. Home. I need to yeah. know who's going. So, and they don't really address that. No, they don't. Which is really unfortunate. It's so sad. It's, you know, and it's true that probably there's not. I'm not a lot sure of, there's not out. There's anything there's not, out there exactly. to tell us. There's probably right. not a lot of data to tell us, and so that leaves you with your judgment. But this article really doesn't go into no. that. So unfortunately, if you're looking for that as an answer, I'm not going to be able to tell you that. 
Okay, so what are we gonna do up front? We're gonna fluid resuscitate our patients. We wanna maintain target hemoglobin levels. And what they advocate for in this particular paper is that in most patients, you wanna shoot for a hemoglobin over seven. Mm -hmm. That would be the lower limit of what you would tolerate right. without a transfusion. But certainly if you have somebody who's got ischemic cardiovascular disease, they've got lots of medical problems. You can't get to them for a while. There may not be any intervention that you can offer them for a while. Then your target might rise to nine, mm -hmm. they offer up. So those are the two targets they, they those offer those are reasonable. Us. Reasonable. Those make sense. I agree. Now, in terms of the initial diagnostic evaluation, as I said earlier, there are certain, a certain population of patients who are having a what appears to be a lower GI bleed, but actually may be an upper GI bleed. Which is a lot of, a lot of times you get the, any cons consultation and they'll tell you, did you put the NG down? Right. Right? Exactly. Yeah, they want to know. They want to know. And so if you have a really rapid trap, like you've got a lot of GI bleeding happening, but that's, an, that's, a, that's like a, a laxative. That's yeah. like an osmotic going to shoot it is. through your system. Your gut doesn't like it. So you don't know right away from seeing a lower GI bleed whether or not it's upper or lower per se. So somebody who's got a lot of bleeding going on, they're very unstable, it could be an upper GI bleed. And so a lot of GI specialists will do an EGD before they do a colonoscopy to evaluate this as the potential source. So that actually upper GI evaluation may be part of your diagnostic evaluation for a lower GI bleed. Right. And they don't mention like the use of NG tubes in this paper, right. which is a controversial area anyway. So just know that that's that, probably that why is they not, didn't wait into yeah, it. <laughs> that's not covered in this paper. Yeah. This is the upper endoscopy, not yeah. looking for blood other ways. Correct. Now, most of these patients, if we're talking about lower GI bleed, the diagnostic procedure of choice is going to be colonoscopy. So it's Take no surprise that that is going to be recommended in nearly all of these patients. The colonoscopy can be both diagnostic and therapeutic because if you find a bleeding source that you can intervene upon during you your colonoscopy, it. then that's a good thing. Um, they advocate that this should be done within 24 hours of presentation. Obviously, the resuscitation should come first. And ideally, you're going to clean out that colon before yep. you're going to go peeking around peek with a there. camera. <laughs> so remember that you're going to want to get a colonic cleansing regimen. And they add, I think it's like four liters of yeah, go lightly, basically, right? right? Four yeah. liters. A lot. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I know you've been lying here in bed in the Yikes. ER bleeding out of your bottom. But we're go. going to we really fluid resuscitated you. Yeah. Now we're going to get to go lightly to like clean you out. <laughs> Um, there, they, say, so they tell us that there are some studies that show that, the, that an earlier colonoscopy, like in the first 12 to 24 hours, can actually shorten your length of stay and give you an earlier answer to what's going on. So, not Just surprising. means your consultant has to come and do it. Do it. And they may not have a completely clean colon That's on right. their side, we, which we, is also something. We need something. that pristine yeah. colon. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, in terms of that um, initial diagnostic evaluation, where is most of this lower GI bleeds coming from? What is the etiology? And this list is something you've, we've mostly seen before mm -hmm. when we learn about these diverticulosis. Diverticulosis tops the list. This is a third to 60%, 65% of these bleeds. Next on the list would be ischemic colitis. Which is interesting. Which is interesting. Hemorrhoids. That's not what I would have put there. I would not have that. Mm -hmm. That one was surprising to me. So ischemic colitis comes next. Then we have hemorrhoids. Both of those are in the 5 to 20% category. And then we have polyps and cancers, colorectal polyps and neoplasms, that's 2 to 15%. And then we have the, I like this word, angioectasias. Yes, I love that. This is just blood vessels gone awry. Yes. Angioectasias. <laughs> gone rogue, they've gone rogue. 5 to 10%, and then everything else is sort of in the less than 5% category. So diverticulosis, the vast majority at the top of the list. Highly, highly questioned. Highly question worthy. Question yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what about the patient who's really bleeding a lot? They're still hemodynamically unstable. Even if you've been resuscitating them, we're not going to be able to get to a colonoscopy. What are our other options? Mm -hmm. And how do we figure out what's going on? Well, certainly CT angio seems oh, yeah. like comes to mind as something that can help us. And that would be your initial studies of choice. And actually, a CT angio, I didn't know this fact, can detect bleeding rates of 0.3 milliliters per minute. Right, which is interestingly... You, but it has to be doing it right then. Yes, it has to be actively bleeding. Like actively bleeding yes. at least 0.3 per minute. Right. So, and it's always that moment of like, just they stop just as yes. you were putting in the dye. But <laughs> right. yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. But it can accurately localize the site of bleeding up to 100% in some studies. Which is important if you're going to try to fix it. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. And don't forget that obviously this could also be used therapeutically. You can be doing an angiogram and do some intervention in, in that respect as well. So it could be used in that way as well. And then there's also some fancy other studies that I'd never order, which would be this red blood cell scintigraphy with the radionuclei. Right you know, technetium study, and that can even detect bleeding rates as low as 0 0.1 c cc or ml. Right. That's not so usually us, though. We're, we're not usually ordering that. Right no. But just so you know, there's fancy stuff you can do. There are fancy, fancy. <laughs> Outside of what you normally order. 
Now, certainly endoscopically, there's therapies that they can offer. They can inject the bleeding site. They can use dilute epinephrine to kind of do some vasoconstriction. They can do thermocautery. They can clip or band ligate. And these things are best, obviously, for diverticulosis, the angioectasias, the post-polypectomy, the person who just mm -hmm. had their polyps removed and now is bleeding, to go in after that and clip that, et cetera. And those success rates can be quite high, and they don't re-bleed a whole lot. So if, you, if they have a lesion mm -hmm. that's amenable to this and you have someone who can do it, then great. If you can do that, great. And it has a very good outcome. Adverse events are quite low, 0.3 to 1.3%. Now, if you're, not, if you're just sort of dripping along or the bleeding rate is too slow, <laughs> then the angiography like could be negative. I'm yes. just dripping along. I'm just dripping <laughs> along, and the angio could be negative. So you could have a false negative in that, in that case. But if the bleeding rate is that low, then it's probably right. not that serious. Right. That's the other part of that. Now, they, have, they mentioned this other fancy therapy that's, is again, sort of beyond the, the realm of what we do in emergency medicine, but to know that the specialists talk about something like a selective transcatheter endovascular therapy that they could use to basically decrease Increase the amount of arterial perfusion at the bleeding site. They can also do some embolizations. There are some fancy things that mm -hmm. can be done that have pretty good success rates. Thank goodness. Yeah. Now, surgery is not off the list, and some people are going to be bleeding so much that surgery, and maybe where you work, that's what you have available to you. And if you somebody's bleeding that, to yeah. death, this is where you're going to go. So someone who's got ongoing lower GI bleeding, and maybe they've had the endoscopy approach and it's failed, or you work somewhere where they're bleeding to death and you don't even have that available, surgery can be done. And yep. you can do a segmental colonic resection and save someone's life. Mm -hmm. um, and if they can't identify exactly where it's coming from, there are obviously different levels of that tube that you can remove to save someone's life. So they can even and this used to be before we had all exactly. these other interventions. This yeah. used to be what they did. Yes. So we think about all these fancy things endoscopically and geographically, but really don't forget that surgery is ultimately something that could be life saving. Scalpel. Yeah. Now, certainly, if you are on antiplatelet agents, then your risk of a GI bleed and the complications associated with that are going to be increased. And so they say that the risk of lower GI bleeding is actually three times the risk of upper GI bleeding yeah. when you have uh, antiplatelet anti agents on, yeah. on board. So um, in terms of, uh, remember that in patients that have cardiovascular disease, there's also risk benefits to consider as well. And they talk about the increased risk of re-bleed is offset by the decreased risk of their cardiovascular event in, in talking about who should be on antiplatelet therapies. There are patients who have cardiovascular problems that despite this increased risk, they need to be on those therapies. Right. And so those things are going to have to be measured as someone's had one of these events and you're talking about re-bleed. Right, and that's where the gastroenterologist and the surgeons will talk to the cardiologist yes. and I'll talk to the patient and yes. they'll kind of work it out. Yes. How about patients who are on dual antiplatelet therapy or need that after they've had a GI bleed? And there's not much data. So again, this is going to be a total judgment call right. about the patient in front of you, the risk-benefit ratio, um, and whether or not, you know, if they've had a cardiac stent in the last three months and now they've had this happen, they may need to be on those drugs. So you're going to have to look at the situation again, um, to consider. Again, that's unfortunately usually out of our... You yeah. Know. So let's just summarize here. The most uh, Diverticular disease is definitely the top of the list in terms of causes of lower GI bleeding, diverticular disease. Most cases of lower GI bleeding stop spontaneously. Mm -hmm. We don't often have to go in and intervene. They usually just stop. But there are patients who are at risk for a poor outcome. Those are the ones that are really, really sick. They have advanced AIDS. They've got other serious medical problems. They're on antiplatelet agents, maybe even dual antiplatelet agents. And if you put your finger up there and you've got fresh blood, yeah, that means yeah. that something's actively going on. Yep. Who's at higher risk of a more of a complication. We're going to resuscitate with crystalloid initial therapy. We're going to remember those target goals for our hemoglobin, seven and nine. And we're going to try to get people to colonoscopy within 24 hours, as long as patients stabilize and they can tolerate the procedure. And they may need upper endoscopy as well, depending on whether there's questions about mm -hmm. whether, whether that blood's, where that blood's coming from. Um, you know, for patients who have had cardiovascular events and they need aspirin for secondary prevention, that is likely to be recommended to be continued because it is of such a benefit to them that, yes, it's a risk for lower GI bleed, but they need that. So that will probably be, be continued. But dual antiplatelet therapy, if they've had a recent acute coronary syndrome event or they've had a stent place, they might need it. Um, you're going to have to talk about that. The specialist mm -hmm. will talk about that without you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But exactly. to know, to know talk that amongst conversation your, Talk amongst happening. yourselves. Yes, they will talk amongst themselves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this, yeah, this article is another one that's mainly, no, not mainly, a lot of internal medicine. I yeah. do wish they had, these articles had little things like, what do we do? Should we reverse? Right. When should we reverse? And that, yeah. a lot of those practical things. Yeah, the that things come that we really have us. to try to decide. So, yeah. but they didn't. They so didn't. there you go. There you go.